Hello, I'm Charles Radcliffe at the United Nations. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights opens with the immortal words, all human beings are born free and equal. And yet around the world, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender and intersex people are harassed, attacked, imprisoned and treated in a discriminatory manner. For many, the promise of the Universal Declaration rings hollow. They feel anything but free and equal. In 2010, UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and High Commissioner for Human Rights Navi Pillay launched a global appeal for the decriminalization of homosexuality and for further measures to end homophobic violence and discrimination. Since then, we've seen the adoption of the first ever UN resolution on the issue, the first official UN report, and the first formal intergovernmental debate. After a long period of denial, a dialogue among states is at last unfolding at the United Nations. A lid has been lifted. Now, this is an issue where the politics are shifting fast. In 2005, when a statement expressing concern at violations against LGBT people was first circulated at the United Nations, 32 countries signed it. Within a year, that number had grown to 54. By 2008, it had increased to 67. And by 2011, to 85 states from all regions. Even so, deep divisions remain. And it's the same objections that come up again and again. First, that LGBT people are somehow asking for new rights or special rights. The fact is that the rights being demanded are neither new nor special. They are age old and universal. They're exactly the same rights that we're all entitled to. Among them, the right to life, to personal security, privacy, health, education, to freedom from discrimination and freedom of expression, association and assembly. So no new rights needed, just proper enforcement of existing ones. Second, some say that because human rights treaties don't explicitly mention homophobic discrimination, that states have no legal obligation to tackle it. But international law requires states to protect the rights of everyone, without distinction. There's no fine print, no hidden exemption clause in any of our international human rights treaties that would permit a state to guarantee full rights to some, but withhold them from others, purely on the basis of their sexual orientation or their gender identity. Third, there is the view that sexual orientation and gender identity are somehow Western concepts that are being unfairly imposed on unwilling nations. But sexual orientation and gender identity are no more Western than racial identity or disability or age are Western. We all have a sexual orientation and a gender identity, whether we talk about it or not. It's part of our makeup as human beings. In fact, if anything can be traced to the West, it's the existence of many criminal laws that are used to prosecute and punish people on the basis of their sexual orientation and gender identity. These laws, that are still in place in some 76 countries, were in most cases imposed in the 19th century by the colonial powers of the day. They're relics of a bygone age. Perhaps the most common objection we hear is that same-sex relationships run counter to religious teachings and to prevailing traditional and cultural values in many societies. Now, it would be wrong to underestimate the importance of tradition, culture and religion in shaping society, but they're not monolithic, nor can they override individual freedoms. The collective, however united, cannot impose its shared traditions, culture and religious beliefs on an individual against his or her wishes. Take religion. Freedom of religion is a fundamental right. It's anchored in international law. People are fully entitled to believe and to follow in their own lives whatever religious teachings they choose. What's more, they're entitled to protection from discrimination on the basis of their religious beliefs. But they're not entitled to discriminate against others whose views and values differ from their own. This is not the first time that tradition, culture and religion have been used as a pretext for denying people equal rights. Slavery, child marriage, marital rape, honor killings, the denial of property and inheritance rights to women, female genital mutilation, all of these have been defended in their time on grounds of tradition, culture, 
or religion. In this case, the conflict between the rights of LGBT people on the one hand and culture, tradition and religion on the other is a false one. The protection of one need not be at the expense of the other. The key is to bring the debate back to the rights of individuals, including the right to define their own values, beliefs and culture for themselves. Now, we still have a long way to go to end violence and discrimination against LGBT people. The debate here at the United Nations is just starting. To be meaningful, it must be informed by the facts. And that requires violations to be systematically monitored, documented and reported. The same level of scrutiny should apply to these violations as to all others. This is a great human rights cause on a par with earlier struggles to eliminate other kinds of prejudice and discrimination. Overcoming resistance, countering prejudice, convincing governments to step up and protect LGBT people, none of this will be easy. But the defense of basic rights demands nothing less of us. Thank you.